Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by Zoe Jong, um, who has, who, well, as I've been discovering on my research, is a big name in the Salesforce space over in Canada, on Canada's West Coast, um, but also is direct or basically running revenue operations at TaskTop. Um, so I'm assuming we're going to jump into a bit of Salesforce stuff, which is going to be great. But then also we're going to be discussing the revenue operation. Task top Zoe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's kick off by understanding how you first got into well, either sales or revenue operations, whatever label we want to use. Um, how did you get into it in the first place? Yeah, uh, a little bit non-traditional, or I guess I think uh, more. the more I talk to people in the sales up space, perhaps it is more traditional. I, uh, I come from a highly technical background. So uh, I went to school uh, for chemistry, and then I was doing electrochemical research um, when I came out of school. And, you know, I knew I was looking for something a little bit more project-oriented, a little bit more... Um, uh, Working with others, I think <laughs> research is great, but it, it can be solitary at times. Um, and so I was looking for a, an opportunity to get into the business world, uh, which is a little bit difficult, I think, when you come with, uh, with a chemistry background. Uh, I ended up getting a job essentially as a, as a glorified receptionist, an office manager, answering phones, uh, um, EAing for, you know, our CEO and was able to just, you know, once I finished those tasks, ask around, see if anybody else was available. Um, and I think very fortuitously was able to grow um, laterally, you know, taking on uh, finance, HR, uh, sales ops, uh, really get a taste for what all of these different departments have to offer. Um, before I think realizing that really where I wanted to go was the sales ops route, um, the ability to kind of take something that is ever shifting and constantly improve it, I think was just uh, right up my alley. And so I found myself uh, doing more specialization in sales ops. And then before I knew it, um, it was really kind of what I was doing with my life. So yeah, it's, uh, it's great. I think I, I, I'm happy to have the job and, and in the job every day. So, Sure. Now, interestingly, I also study chemistry and I had the same revelation after Ooh. doing a final year project, realizing that actually I'm not that good at being super detailed playing with chemicals, but probably yeah. <laughs> exactly the same. Um, but, but, and so what I wanted to ask about that is that you are obviously a highly analytical person. Um, why do you think that, well, knowing that, or do you think that part of you drove you towards sales ops or enables you to enjoy sales ops more? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I think that there's there's a certain amount of wanting to know how things work that uh, definitely plays into it. Um, yeah, I think even as a kid, I always wanted to know, uh, you know, how does these things work? And and I was really into building. And I think that that's what originally drove me into, into chemistry in the first place. Um, and sales ops sort of gives you that same feeling, right? You, you can still um, go in and really deeply dive into whether it's a, it's an individual problem or, or a piece of software. Uh, you really have the opportunity to dig in and really understand what's happening there and then go and build more onto that. And so I think it sort of kind of fits both of those niches for me. Got it. Awesome. Um, and then this is a super fascinating journey um, through the business, right? Because you you came from doing a relatively low role over it's nine years, right? To That's right. coming and now being responsible for the whole, like I assume, sales marketing, the operations of sales marketing, customer success, right? Uh, yes, yeah. So it's kind of like from lead acquisition all the way through customer retention. Nice. Uh, so that's like congratulations. That's an sh- amazing like journey. Um, Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So now looking at the the sales tech stack that you're currently running. Uh, so yeah, we've got a lot of tools in there. I think like all good uh, like all good ops people, you find yourself every now and then discovering a new tool that snuck its way in. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, we have Salesforce uh, as one of our primary uh, primary tools. 
Um, Salesforce has been great for me over the years in that it's really, really customizable. So I've been able to kind of build out custom objects, build a, a custom workflow to support what we were trying to achieve uh, with, you know, who was leading each individual department. And um, I think this year we're looking at, okay, you know, is that still the same process that we're living today? Is there any ways that we can get rid of in the in that tool? Um, and then, you know, a, a lot of tools that kind of circle around the outside of Salesforce. So uh, Cirrus Insight to integrate into that. Uh, we use Discover Org to... Um, it's sort of like a lead database, uh, lead purification a little bit. Um, we're recently bought Chorus uh, to do our uh, call analytics, which is great. Um, and so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, and then from a corporate standpoint, of course, we've got um, all of the good tools like Slack and Jira and uh, lots of things hanging around that I think support software uh, specifically. Sure. And just to give us a picture, how many, well, sales and service reps are current if your operation team currently supporting? Um, yeah, our go-to-market team is probably about 80 people. So um, sort of inclusive of all of the customer facing teams. Cool. And so that includes relatively small. <laughs> <laughs> that includes marketing as well. That's right. Yeah. Cool. And then how many people in operations supporting them? Uh, we just got a third. So now there are three of us. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and are they, do they sit within revenue operations as well, or are they aligned to say sales or service? So yeah, they sit inside of, uh, revenue operations, but they, uh, their individual activities are a little bit more aligned to the sales side. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Um, I'm assuming your team is responsible for the data quality mm -hmm. within inside Salesforce. Is that correct? Yeah, I like to say that the data quality is the responsibility of the individual putting in the data. Uh, it's our responsibility to ensure that that data uh, brings them value too. So I think one of the things that I bring up the most often is, um, you know, there, there's sort of a difference between the things we want to track and the things that uh, we can actually have tracked. And so I think that there's a desire to say, oh, well, we want... We want sales to give us this information and that information and this information, but um, you know, where's the straight line between sales providing that information and then like driving more business for us and for them? Um, I think the more you uh, the more you make decisions based on that, uh, that that the individual you're looking for the value from is getting value out of it, um, that the data quality hopefully becomes the responsibility of the person entering the data. Um, although, you know, I do say you probably get about three fields that you could ask for that are just because it's your job fields. Mm -hmm. uh, and those ones probably it's it's up to us to ensure there's some sort of validation or, or um, automation to help make sure those fields get filled out. Got it. Yeah. So you're passing the responsibility to the individual, but you're also saying that we will try and help you uh, to do this. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Um, and on that note, when you do have something that you want either service or sales reps to do that might not necessarily be in there, be an immediate benefit for them. How, how do you go about influencing them to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there it's it's always multi pronged, uh, especially when you're asking um, these people and uh, to be out there and be selling your product. And you know, of course, I think we typically have uh, five or six different requirements of salespeople at any given time that they're supposed to be inputting data. Um, I think. The, the biggest one is getting executive buy-in, right? Ensuring that their management is wants that information too um, or understands the value of that information and where it's going so they can communicate that back. Um, even if it's not something that brings me value right at this moment, I think understanding that the, the value downstream is helpful. And, and when those questions come up saying, you know, this is taking a good amount of my time or, uh, oh, I just always forget to do that. Um, I think having a manager who's there to support that process is really, really positive, um, as well as just systematic changes. You know, if there's something that we need um, filled out weekly in Salesforce, then there should definitely be a list view that's editable where they can edit all of those all at once or um, update them kind of in one solid go without having to 
open, open, edit, click, save, open, edit, click, save, you know, anything that can reduce the number of clicks or kind of the pain to filling out that information, um, the better it will be. So uh, kind of throughout our organization, we're using um, things like validation or list rules or, or automation to um, bring up kind of screen flows to help support um, support that process all across the board. Got it. And are you personally like the Salesforce admin or is one of the other people in your team like the person doing that stuff? Yeah, I think uh, I have another person in my team who is uh, just starting to get into that. I think um, over the years, I have built up our Salesforce organization. So, of course, I am the only one I have to blame when I find gross uh, stuff in there. I think um, it's been long enough that I've purged out all of the really terrible things. And now, uh, of course, when I come across um, kind of older, ill-written things, I'm always like, oh, <laughs> really past me is not taking care of future me in this instance, but uh, hopefully there's not too, too many of those in the system. Uh, but yeah, I would say uh, I'm majorly our, our primary admin. And then um, we also have a, a marketing ops who's uh, helping in the system as well as, um, as well as uh, one of my team sales ops people. Got it. Um, making reps more productive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's, I've, I've always struggled personally, you know, we have a very remote team, so it's very difficult to be right on top of what they're doing or, you know, what calls they're having. And especially we've run a very remote team on pretty um, non- not non-tracked process, but, you know, we just got chorus recently. I think uh, we're definitely looking into a sort of sales AI tool this year, one that can overlay over all of the data and, and populate things that could potentially be at risk because they've been open too long, our amounts too high, amounts too low, not enough people. Um, that type of thing will be great. Um, I think for today, a lot of it is just understanding the seller themselves. Um, we're running a sort of day in the life uh, this quarter with my team where we are speaking to every salesperson, asking them, uh, you know, what what's keeping you from doing your work? What, you know, what do you find the most tedious? What do you think you could use training on? Gathering that information and then weekly meeting with my team to sort of disseminate that information amongst us so that we can all, uh, I think, understand what sales is actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis, um, both from the kind of seller point of view and from the sales management point of view, and then take that as a good kind of, cr let's create a roadmap out of that as to how we can make them more productive, how we can get the right data or the right behaviors out of them. Got it. So actually having a call or sitting down with each salesperson and mapping out what they're doing in a day and then trying to... Yeah, I split them up amongst my entire team so that it would be easier. But <laughs> it is. that's why it's taking the full quarter and not just, uh, not just being done in a week. But I do think um, when you can get, I, th I think, the opinion of the person who will be impacted by the change the most, um, you really start to... You really start to learn, you know, I think the best next step you can see, okay, with across everybody, these are the things that we could really take some quick wins on. Um, and so although, although it does take quite a bit of time at the front end, I think that the value you get over the year is, is definitely worth it. Got it. And the most of these reps are remote because they're field agents that have to go like selling reasonably like large ACVs. So actually have to go and work with the customers is that the reason that's right yeah the majority of them uh are sort of outbound sales we do have a, a few account managers um basically uh main priorities are nurturing and qualifying the pipeline um as well as working with the sellers um uh, on sort of like an inside sales basis um so yeah we do have uh, both of those and and we are kind of including both to in the in the day in the life, but um, for the most part, most of them are, are as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Have you had any like shocking realization? Well, uh, what one have you done the day in the life? Yeah, and then out of the ones you have done, do you have any like shocking realizations like that salespeople were doing this thing when they shouldn't be doing that? 
<laughs> so uh, I, we haven't started this quarter yet, but the but I have done it in the past. I think um, in doing it in the past, that is sort of the joke I said about the tech stack, right? You're always kind of occasionally bumping into uh, tech stack items um, that you didn't know were in existence. So uh, yeah, I think there's always a little piece of that, right? They're using some piece of software or they've put something in their Chrome or their email that... Um, that's a surprise to us, but I also think, uh, Cirrus, Cirrus itself was a surprise to us when we did this the last time. And, um, you know, having a tool that can easily create leads, create contacts, you know, update activities really easily, uh, as well as give that snapshot was uh, a good enough ROI that we thought we would roll it out at a larger scale. And this is like a case study for, software marketers right so if we're like trying to get our software in the hands there's like because that's beautiful for serious marketing <laughs> right right where they're like download this i think uh in- until companies have pretty strict policies about that probably <laughs> um sales forecasting uh what is the process and how are you guys involved yeah um you know the process is very much still based on our sales leadership so uh basically we're involved in we creating um a series of dashboards reporting trying to slice and dice the data the best we can um i think like many other orgs we have a significant amount of custom fields that are populating whether that's their workflow manually or um or they themselves are just formula fields that make that type of reporting better um, and so, yeah, we've created some some new dashboards this year as well as a kind of all new reporting to try and support the changes in in what we're asking sales to be measured by. So this year we're really pivoting towards a just new and expansion, um, uh, you know, targets, new and expansion compensation, all of that. And uh, so, kind of updating all of the reporting and dashboarding to support that. Uh, And then the sales leaders basically consume that data. Um, You know, right now, I think we we don't have a a significantly amazing process for that. You know, each one kind of does it in their own way. Um, I'd love to say we're using something like Salesforce forecasting, but it was a little bit limiting. So um, now it's, you know, I think just open uh, these open reports and, and kind of live conversations that are happening. Sure. Um, And then from your experience in sales operations, what has been a sales metric that is your favorite or is the most insightful? Oh, it's my favorite. (laughs) Um, hmm. You know, I think that uh, the, the types of measurements, it's so easy to just run up a bunch of, of measurements and say, okay, now we're measuring the number of new opportunities or the percentage of renewals in this way or that way, or um, uh, I think each individual department kind of slicing their own piece of the pie, right? Saying, okay, from this point to this point, this is what I'm measuring. Um, I think the KPIs that I personally love the most are ones that um, suddenly when you're looking at them, you you feel like, wow, this is really insightful. Um, I think, uh, for example, we used to measure, okay, here's just the number of demos we've done. Interesting. Um, but saying something like, okay, here are the number of technical one evals that are still open or, you know, the percentage of technical one evals that have, uh, you know, have gone to close one. Those are really metrics where I'm like, suddenly you're crossing those two different functions. And it's more interesting to me to learn about, um, you know, if we're getting to technical win, but we're not getting to close or there's a delay to close, you know, there's something there that we can really improve upon. Uh, Or, you know, maybe there's something there that we can provide more resources to the sellers so they can, you know, have more proposals or have better outreach during that timeframe. So I think, you know, from a purely operational side of house, um, those are the type of, of metrics that I love because I think in and of themselves, they highlight um, areas that can be improved. Got it. So actionable conversions between different stages. Yes. Yeah. Over time and then tweak. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> and finally, who in the world of sales operations or revenue operations has uh, taught you the most? Hmm. You know, I, uh, 
I would have to say I run the local community group here, uh, the Salesforce community group. And uh, my co-leader uh, is just an amazing, amazing woman. I mean, I think like she's uh, definitely inspirational in, in both, I think, um, just how to look at the system a little bit more, how to be a little bit better um, organized. Um, her name is uh, Alexandra Reto. Oh, I always mess this up. Reto Vinovich. And uh, um, yeah, I would say, you know, from, from just being a, a better sales ops leader, I definitely um, account a bunch of that to her. So. Big shout out. Well, what, what was the name again? It was Alan. Alexandra. Alex. Shout out to Alexandra. That's yes. <laughs> um, and we should also do a shout out to the, the Salesforce like event you guys run, right? Yes, please. Uh, so I basically, um, for those of the people on the phone who don't know about Dream and Events, um, basically they're community-led mini Dream Forces. I don't know if we're allowed to say that, but... Um, they are Salesforce conferences. They are run anywhere from, you know, there's some that are half days. There's some that are full weeks um, or typically, you know, three days, four days, something like that. Uh, they're all over the world. And True North Dreamin was the first Canadian community led conference. So um, lots of alliteration there. But last year we hosted in Ottawa. Um, we had intended to migrate cities every year, and this year we made it to Vancouver. Hooray! So, <laughs> where can people find where can people find True North Dreaming online? Just Google that, I guess. So yeah, if they go to True North Dreaming, there's no G there. So uh, truenorthdreaming.com, then they'll find uh, our lovely website and information. It's uh, April uh, 23rd and 24th in 2020, and we're hosting here at. Uh, at the UBC uh, Nest, which is a beautiful new lead platinum building. So well, there we go. So here, here are the things I liked from the conversation. Um, your comments are about being analytical and that driving you towards, or, or you actually have more of the lesson of you like finding your home in sales <laughs> operations, which I thought was quite interesting. And it does make sense that your analytical self would, would do that. Um, having the individual being responsible for data quality, but still trying to help them. I'm doing that. And then the day in the life exercise, which I think really every sales ops or rev ops team should do, or, and, and, and maybe they do, but if not so like formal, or they haven't just given it the nice name. Right. Um, because it, it's kind of, it reminded me of doing like customer calls when you're like creating an early startup product, you like have calls to try to understand your customer's life. And this is kind of what you guys are doing with your sales reps, which I think is really important. Well, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so Zoe, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Yeah, it was my pleasure as well.